Bonjour, bonsoir, dear friends, and bienvenue on JCB Live. Today, in this midsummer of August, we're going to go to New York to one of the most beautiful loft ever. One of the most charismatic men in the wine world. But guess what? We share a birthday together, the seductive, sensual 1969. We share the passion for wine, but we don't share a curriculum vitae. He was one of the most graduate, awarded diploma men that I know. Bachelor's degree in Stanford, master's degree, law degree. But he said to his mother, I did the bar exam just to please you. He decided <laughs> to go in the wine. He's an entrepreneur, a book writer, and he has an incredible series of webinar called Bevy Mar. And we're going to put the link so you can all see Mark Oldman himself. He's written two fabulous books. I know he's writing many more as we speak. And we are so excited to have him. So, dear friends, here is the famous Mark Oldman. Yeah. Thank you for that champagne salute, John Charles. It's exhilarating to be here with you. Cheers. Well, cheers, Mark. And I'm so excited. I know we could not get together, although we promised. When are you coming to California or Burgundy? Because we need to share a bottle of Clos Vougeau together of 1969. Oh my God, I would be so into that. Burgundy is probably my favorite wine. 1969, of course, in, in homage to both of us is one of my favorite years and a very good year, Burgundy. In fact, actually, let me show you something. Forgot to tell you. So I contracted with a great um, ceramic artist in Australia and I had him make ceramics of some of my favorite wines jcb Fantastic. will be coming well i hope so we gotta have 69 together <laughs> well here's well with the ceramic that's what i meant yes yeah yeah please please uh this is a family show i think so but here's <laughs> your wife is watching my wife is watching so yeah you know. yeah <laughs> but ekem in our birth year this is it's giant, by the way, it looks like a giant candle. I know you guys have great candles, too. But anyway, I just wanted to uh, celebrate our 1969 vintage. And I can see you have a, dub, a, a magnum behind you of Dom Perignon 69. I assume you've drank it from the bottle. Oh, my God. Uh, it, it didn't it wasn't shared much. This is hard to get. And another it, it amazes me how good that vintage year is. So I'm trying to buy up uh, as many bottles as possible. And I'm going to look to uh, Vujo. Uh, I think I'm going to have to enter some of those into my wine collection. So what's your month of birth, Mark? My, my what of birth? Month of uh, oh, month. January, January 5th. I'm a Capricorn, which I don't think is the best sun sign. I think it, I'm not gloomy, but it's supposed to be gloomy, ruled by Saturn. Oh, but, I see, I see. How about you? So, you're, you're probably well, a Leo, I'm thinking. I'm a Virgo of all Virgo. people. <laughs> Ascendant Libra, I was conceived, I believe, at Christmas of 1970, and, um, uh, or, or 68, of course, and uh, born in September during harvest of burgundy the famous harvest of 69 so you know my mother doesn't want to give me too many details on the conception but she gave me a lot of details on the arrival <laughs> i love it well here's to the harvest of 69. <laughs> so mark you have created one of the most amazing wine circles in the world and you know as the bacchus on the campus at stanford so two questions. One, why did you not practice law? And two, you could start in whichever way you want. Okay. How did you create this amazing wine circle that has become one of the most iconic things to do at Stanford? Well, uh, first of all, let's take the law thing because that's easy. I <laughs> basically, yeah, yeah, you know, it's like, um, what, what do you call a thousand lawyers at the bottom of a lake? a good start you know 
<laughs> Listen, I love lawyers. I need lawyers. Sometimes we all need lawyers, but you have to have a certain personality for it. And honestly, I kind of went because I got in and because um, it bought me time to figure out what my true passion was. Um, and the, your beautiful Bay Area and Stanford, the Stanford campus itself was just, is just one of the most blissful places in the world. In fact, um, hopefully it won't be for a long, long time, but you can scatter my ashes, like take half of them in Burgundy and then <laughs> half of them on the Stanford campus and I'll be happy for eternity. I've never said that, by the way, that's, that's kind of a <laughs> poetic thing, but um so I think I with all so the many... wine you're drinking, you're going to live forever. So I don't even think we can think <laughs> of ashes ever. And you're looking younger than ever before. So you see, the but more so we are go... you. The embalming effect of good wine. This is, people don't realize it. You know, there's sometimes negative publicity about people who take wine to excess. But if you can drink it in moderation, it actually embalms you and... Um, it enlightens you, it refreshes you. But anyway, um, so uh, we're talking, uh, uh, I saw too many of my friends go to law school, become corporate lawyers and immediately become unhappy and leave within two to five years. So it was like seeing ahead, you know, the march off the cliff. And I just avoided that by going to law school, passing the bar, but never even summering in a law firm and trying to figure out what was um, really exciting and passionate uh, for me. But before that, I was, uh, as an undergrad at Stanford, I was doing the study abroad program in Oxford, England, and they have a team- uh, Regulation, by the way, oh, what a school. Amazing school. They kind of take themselves a little bit seriously, not to diss all of Oxford. I'm going to get a lot of hate mail for this, but the worst uh, Oxonian or the worst, most snobby English person is the American studying over in Oxford who thinks he's uh, an English person. And that was who was head of the Oxford wine circle. And I begged to be on the uh, uh, team. It was actually a, a, a junior varsity or half blue team. They competed. It still exists. They compete with Cambridge. It's an awesome, like a Super Bowl of blind tasting. And there were these practices. And as someone who didn't know anything about wine growing up, I asked if I could just participate as an observer in these practices. And at the first or second practice, they told me, by the way, we're not going to call on you. But after 45 minutes of blind tasting, uh, they're like, okay, Mr. American, what kind of wine do you think this is? And uh, I had no This is idea. very Monty Python, by the way. A multi? This is very Monty Python, by the way. A, 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 it's a Monty Python out. Yeah, it's totally. And maybe a, mixed with a little curb your enthusiasm too, because the former president of the Oxford Wine Circle was sitting next to me, had the answer key of this blind tasting. And I had written down every word from the answer key thinking this would be my very first module of wine knowledge. This is where I start learning about wine. So I'd written it all down, but when they called on me and they're like, what wine is this? I was like, um, I don't know, um, Sancerre maybe? Uh, you know, left bank of Loire, uh, 1989. Wow. Uh, and they were gobsmacked. They were, oh, we've got a ringer. We've got a ringer, Mr. American. And they let me on the team. And needless to say, I couldn't reproduce that initial success ever again. But I learned so much about wine. And then I got back to Stanford. I'm like, OK, we're not going to create a competitive team we're going to do a very inclusive team and invite the top winemakers in napa sonoma up from santa barbara paul draper from ridge bruce cake bread from cake bread doning dyer from domaine chandon you name it they would come i thought we would have to pay them but instead they were chomping at the bit for a couple of reasons number one uh one winemaker told me that at that time there was no shopping in napa valley so the Stanford Mall and its Nordstrom provided good shopping. Uh, 
Two, they did want to market to college students, and they know that that, that marketing uh, bond stays a lifetime if the quality is really good. And three, and I know we're living in a politically correct world, but let's just say um, some of these winemakers, and some of them were even French, uh, liked the company of coeds. Uh, especially the women's soccer team who went on to become Olympians and all that. They were the most party hardy fun and they were all in the Stanford wine circle. I remember Mr. Robert Mondavi himself came down to speak at my Stanford wine circle and people would line up and get their bo empty bottles signed by this, you know, paragon of Napa Valley. So that is kind of what got me really into, into wine and taught me about managing 45 different tastings from top Napa, Sonoma, Santa Barbara, Monterey people. There's no better at education. That's amazing. And, and from there on, you kept animating the circle and, and uh, going back and forth, but you moved to New York and started a life which is not law. So explain us about this, because this is very unusual. So I would guess you could say, Jean-Charles, my forte, whether it's wine or other things, I like uh, simplifying complex subjects. That's, yes. I really get excited by that. I, I can see when people's light bulb goes off. And that to me, there's no greater purpose for me in this world than to eludicate, to samurai sword cut through, and especially today with social media and TV and the polarization, to get to the truth and the stylishly presented truth to me is really important. And those things in life that do that for me, I really appreciate. So. I started a company with a fellow from my freshman dorm for job seekers called vault.com. And that basically told you how, uh, what the New York office is like versus the San Francisco office. This is for job seekers. So before doing an interview, um, uh, uh, McKinsey, Goldman Sachs, American Express, even Diageo, I mean, you, every type of industry and remember, social media didn't exist. This was, you know, early 90s. So there was no way to get the true inside scoop on companies. Right. So we created this um, dot com. We rolled the roller coaster. I mean, from feast to famine, back to feast again. And to keep my sanity, I wanted to teach wine. So just for fun at night, working 14 hours a day, I'm like, okay, what would really make me happy? Because as you know, you're, you're a great entrepreneur. Um, sometimes it's all about managing people and, and putting out fires and conflict. So I said, you know, I loved starting the Stanford Wine Circle and I learned so much from these 45 different winemakers. Let me teach a beginning wine tasting seminar um in new york and i looked at the back of zagat award-winning wine list and went around hot-footed it to different restaurants met with the gms and they were all like good idea kid but we'd make more money selling wine directly to consumers than having a wine class huh. and then i finally found this place um soho kitchen and bar one of the first great wine yeah. bars in new york a uh, hundred wines by the glass through a crew vinay machine and I asked the owner, great ponytail, he'd seen it all, cubist painting of himself over his desk. And I'm like, can I teach a beginning wine tasting seminar at your place in your empty cabaret room above the crew a machine? And he's like, you know, this is pure. I like this. You market <laughs> it, you teach it. I'll provide the people, I'll provide the wine, so long as you don't pick wine that's too expensive. And we'll split the profits. And we were pretty cool offer from day pretty one. Pretty cool offer to get going. Yeah, it it was it was, and he could tell he could he could sense the sincerity that I just wanted to move people's molecules. I just wanted to get people excited about wine. I wasn't doing it for any darker purpose. 
And he really gave me my first shot, but, um, and that's what got me teaching about wine. So when we ended Vault, we were lucky to sell it to a private equity firm in 08. Then I'm like, all right, now I'm gonna switch into what's really moving my molecules. And that's writing about wine and teaching about wine. So you follow your passion. I mean, this is all about, explain us how one can succeed by following his or her passion. Because I'm, I'm like yeah. you, a firm believer that if you do something you're very passionate about, you'll figure it out. But give us some, as we tasting this wine, we oh, want yeah. to describe it too, because you quite, you I have will. quite the adjectives too. Well, uh, so first of all, this is the JCB number 21, I believe, named for the coat door department. Indeed, indeed. And we save 69 when we see each other, of course. So with our wives, we could celebrate with our date of birth. Huh? <laughs> really look forward to that. Uh, this is so great. Um, I had an extra bottle and over the weekend, I had it with the most amazing luscious pizza. And this has, I mean, what's great about uh, Cremant de Bourgogne for those who don't drink alternatives to champagne is it's far more affordable, but made in that beautiful traditional way. You can see these pinpoint bubbles. I, I fell to my knees because I'm helping clear out my dad's house. I'm helping sell his house out in New Jersey. And I had a bottle of this with me and an Jersey has incredible pizza. Jersey takes a lot of lumps deservedly, but it has the best pizza. And, and this, the almond floral, lemony quality of this and the tiny high quality pinpoint bubbles cut through the richness of the pizza. I was in heaven, John Charles. Wow, what a description. JCV 21 with bubbles, I love it. With pizza, I love it. Oh, I'm try that so soon. good. And by the way, this is part of my philosophy of wine. And I, I can tell the way you're dressed, the way you are not overly um, didactic or, um, you know, you don't take yourself too seriously. You are yeah. very serious about what you do and your quality speaks for itself. Thank but you. I think this is one of the great things about the people at the top of wine that they, uh, can relax about it because so many neophytes or even intermediates or even some experts I know, deep, deep collectors, let's say they're very deep into Burgundy, but you talk Italian wine and they freak out and they get very anxious. You and I try to make people relax about wine. And, and you do such an amazing job and we'll, we'll go to the Bebimar shortly, but but tell us about how you succeeded oh, so yeah. well to follow your passion and, and what advice do you have for everybody with us? Because we have friends yeah. from Asia, Europe, Northern America, South America today with us. And it's so exciting to, to see someone with so much background in education and you have such an overly developed brain <laughs> that you decided just to be so <laughs> successful in a field that you were not necessarily born into or close to because, you know, it takes a lot to want to discover wine and to go to the wine region and to do what you've done. Well, thank you. And it helps when you start young, although it's never too late. And uh, 50s, 60s, 70s, my mom, I just have to say, who's a really cool cat and loves everything French. Uh, she went back to school in her 50s and became a psychologist. And wow. she's like the model and there's no, she can't market herself. She's not a business person, but the people who happen to get her as patients are the luckiest people in the world because not only does she have great ideas and she's a great listener, but like you, John Charles, she's a cool cat and people want to emulate her, not only for her advice and her inherent quality, but for her style too. And this sort of, to have both sides of the brain working, that is a very unusual thing. And people gravitate towards that. But to your question about passion, I teach a class right now in the winter for Stanford University on entrepreneurship um, huh. because of Vault and we made it through that roller coaster. 
And I tell my students, Stanford undergrads, you don't, it's not a pre prerequisite. You don't have to have total passion. Uh, and if you look at some of the entrepreneurs in the world, you know, they have succeeded not having total passion for their subject matter. However, it increases your chances of probability, or it increases your chance of success, the probability yeah. so much more, because as you know, you know, you're a deep, deep entrepreneur. There are so many low moments. You and I both, we're like ducks. We can look yeah. placid on the surface, but the feet are moving really fast underneath. Well, on some of those days when the feet are moving fast, it's dark. And you're like, why am I doing this? And life is short. Well, if you have inherent passion for the subject matter, that gets you through. That pulls you out of those doldrums that every entrepreneur experiences. So if you can kind of figure out, I love art. I'm only a neophyte, um, but I'm getting into art. I, I wish someone wrote a book on art like I wrote about wine because, uh, I, I need it spoon fed to me and I'm learning as much as I can, but how I know what I want to buy or even take a picture of in art is I say it moves my molecules. There's something instinctual yeah. when I see a certain piece of art or even taste certain wine, it just goes to another level that's very hard to put in words, but I, I just know that feeling. It's like falling in love and it's very exciting so if you can find a subject matter that you want to be entrepreneurial about or just want to work in that area of that can nourish you in ways that nothing else will and will take you through those tough moments because there will always be tough moments people see someone like john charles or they might even look at me they're like oh well he just had it easy he he it all clicked for him no 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 the sausage is made every day. And people don't realize that sort of labor. It takes an incredible amount of energy to make it look easy. It almost <laughs> takes more energy to make it look easy, but people well, don't realize. You certainly do. And Mark, it, um, outline for us how you've succeeded, because I think it's so important. You're going soon to Aspen. You're gonna present and do amazing high profile seminars for the finest collectors of wine in the world. You have an amazing, incredible TV program that you animate and you the creator and the animator as well. You've written books on the topic, you teach on the topic. So tell us how you've succeeded to manage so many unique things in the space of wine that has been so difficult to crack for so many. Well, first of all, I tell people um, work like your life depended on it. And I know that sounds extra dramatic, but it's good to be dramatic. I, I think it's good to capture people's attention. And we're not dramatic together, are we? No, there's, there's, there's no verve, there's no elan, there's no uh, cinematic quality. By the way, you need to teach me and all the men of the world how to wear leopard uh, because I've thought about it. I've even asked my wife, Keith Richards, you and Keith Richards of the Rolling Stones, you too are the paragons of being dramatic in that way. I want to add a little in. I'm just, I'm afraid. I, I grew up in New Jersey. I have too many people who are willing to come out of the woodwork to bully me. Well, <laughs> I started to see on my skin those tiger and leopard lines growing. So I said, I might as well wear it and really assert who I am. That's so, you can so see cool. Even behind us, if we zoom in a little bit, see a whole leopard room. Oh, so, I love it. Mark, when you come, we'll have a wonderful, great time in this. <laughs> and we'll be the leopards showing our wife how we get passionate about them, about life, and about doing great things together. Maybe we should start together. I love it. I know you're the Tsar, you're the Bacchus on the campus. But maybe we should start the 1969 club. I, you know, that would be fantastic. Club 69. Ooh club la la. 69. I'm writing it down. I cannot forget this one. Can we do it in Paris? Like, you know, this, you know, first Studio 60, uh, Studio 54, and then 
in the 21st century, John Charles and Mark started Club 69. <laughs> well, I cool. can tell you, loving Studio 54, at least the idea of it, because we're yeah. a little too young to have lived it, we trademark for the fun of it, and I think I'm going to use it this year, Studio 69. So it's about <laughs> time. Let's it really is. That. And can I just say this backdrop reminds me a little bit of Hotel Cost in Paris. It's the kind of den of sin, and I mean that in a good way. And you might know I have a felony room here in the wine sanctuary. But, you know, a little bit of sin, a little bit of naughtiness, I think, because we're all drones. We all work in the cubicles. We're all rushing to meet those deadlines. So a little bit of naughtiness can really fire the imagination. I totally agree. <laughs> Well, I just served the Viognier. Oh, yes. A digression of what we typically, you and I, drink. But, but tell us about how you've succeeded in each and every one of those areas. Because I think a lot of people, specifically after the last 18 months we've all experienced, and certainly probably the next 18, are saying to themselves, I want to continue what I'm doing, but this has been a big eye-opener. I got enlightened by so many other things, and I want to create other avenues of expression for myself. And for me, who very fortunately was born making wine in Vougeot, I've really rarely met personalities like you. And, and, you know, I adore your style and your brain and your mind. And I love the fact, Mark, and I want to stress that on our show here, that it's very unusual to see someone being so successful in so, so many arenas and succeeded to apply his knowledge as you do in books, online, in person, in seminars, and obviously in webinars as you do so well. So give us at least one or two clues of entrepreneurship. Yeah. Of how you do it so people can hopefully follow you. Well, thank you for those kind words. And again, I almost feel like you're my psychologist mom because no one understands me that well. But really, some of it is loving the audience so much and being the audience yourself. I'm just yeah. the audience most of the time, right? We're all each other's audience. And I'm a tough customer. Like if people bore me or if they don't give really good information, like your information and your quality is so good. So I one do. of my theories is, or one of my modus, ways of modus operandi, my way of operating is first, you've got to make the inherent product, whether you're speaking or whether you're making wine, so good that they can't ignore you. It's yeah. got to be as good as all the boring people out there, all the people who have no style, but make a great product. You have to kill yourself for that. You have almost have to take years off your life. As, as happy and as joyous as we are, you, you have to sacrifice for that. There are a lot of long nights in the office or all nighters, but then that's just the baseline. You have to think about how are you going to capture the imagination in this attention economy and even before then i'm a tough customer if you're going to put me to sleep sometimes the, the saddest thing is to have someone with great quality but it's not named 21 or it's not um represented by someone like you who can bring this to life i mean i've got to say i on social media i said I'm going to be on John Charles' show. And the amount of love coming through Thank my you. Instagram, they're like, I love like that level of um, regard and like loyalty is like, that's hard to find. And like to induce that. So Aspen, you mentioned. So luckily, everyone thinks you go and you just get invited back. No, no, no. You're on the razor's edge. They want talent so mm -hmm. um, cutting edge and satisfying to their own people that you you live in terror whether you're going to get invited back. And luckily, I've been invited back the last 15 years. And that's because wow. 
I care so much about the experience of the audience because I'm the audience when I'm not up on the stage. And if you can live with that, you know, Jeff Bezos and like, you know, I, I can't say I'm a huge fan given his latest uh, um, uh, updates in the news. However, he was always maniacally focused on the customer experience, how the customer would perceive Amazon. And to this day, my wife yells at me for so many Amazon boxes coming at our door. And it's because he made it easy. He understood what the pain points were. He understood you know, the, the prime program. So from an entrepreneurial perspective and uh, from a creative perspective, to really listen and adjust, listen and adjust, hear what people say, what they really want and what's not that necessary. And then I'll, I'll say one more thing, ignore the naysayers. There will always be haters. And, the, and John Charles, you probably know this more than anyone, the more successful you get, the more they'll, there will be people in the peanut gallery frustrated for some reason, um, there, there's something going on with them, but it manifests. Uh, well, don't try that, Mark. Don't try that, John Charles. It's not going to work, or that's silly, or whatever. You know, it's the it's the nasty mother-in-law syndrome. I have no idea what your mother-in-law is like <laughs> if she's even her. But they're just a. You know, we see it in the news cycle. We see it everywhere else. But if you can have that passion, that drives you and stops you from losing confidence in your own game, I think you're 90% of the way there. Well, those are fabulous advice, Mark. And, and not only those have advice, this is how you live your life. So talking about content, you said you're going to Aspen, which is great, but I'd love for you to tell us about your two phenomenal, outstanding books and talking about how as an expert that you are, you make things simple and you explain them amazingly well. So maybe you want to show us Billionaire Wines yeah. and as well, the less expensive substitutes. I mean, I love that cover of yours. How to drink like a billionaire. This is such a good one. And by the way, that is like, I should have put a sticker like John Charles endorsed, meaning you love sabering and opening wine in fun ways. And again, it's to express the joie de vivre. It's to express the elan. It's, it's to express, you know, once you really know your wine, then it's about getting contagious with people. It's getting, uh, transferring your excitement to other people. And listen, we have a great product. I mean, it, wine already makes it feel funny and it can taste incredible. Uh, so my books, I tell people I specialize and in my webinars too, um, which are my uh, virtual classes, which I'm, I feel very fortunate. I always feel very fortunate. Someone asked me, you know, you've done a lot, you know, why are you like pretty modest? Because as Jim Morrison once said, the future is uncertain and the end is always near. I don't take anything for granted. And it's like that old showbiz ad, uh, adage, you're only as good as your last performance. And I consider it a performance because I've got to make the information great, but it's also has to captivate because I, that's what I need. And that's what my wife needs. And that's what my friends and family need. But I tell people I specialize in easily implemented nuggets of wine wisdom. I don't want to bore people with malolactic fermentation, with chemistry. And listen, there are such talented winemakers out there, but the ones that really resonate, like you, are the ones that know how to be dangerous, but keep it, keep the technical jargon restrained to fellow like UC Davis grads and fellow winemakers but really talk about the soul and the excitement and the wine culture. So like, I, I, I'm my own tough audience. I'm a mean audience when I'm writing and it takes twice as long to write a book, I think, 
that resonates with people and that's easy to read and doesn't force people to go through eight pages for three lines of really good information. So, and part of that, and I, I diss on law school, I make fun of law school, but law school taught me at Stanford something really interesting. There were certain professors who hid the ball. Concepts, everyone thinks law, law and the bar exam, it's very difficult. It's not. It's like learning the phone book. It's really easy. But what certain <laughs> law professors I'll, do. I'll try that soon. <laughs> I, it's, it's just memorization. Anyone can be a lawyer, trust me. And you see some of these crazy celebrity lawyers out there and you realize like, you know, just put your nose to the grindstone, learn the phone book and you'll pass the bar. However, certain professors took very easy concepts and they obscured them. They put the ball and they put it behind their back. I try to do the opposite in wine. I try to lead with the ball. Here is what you really need to know and nothing more. And now let's talk about what makes you really happy about wine. It's really about helping um, the other person. I, I, I say people are all, everyone's really a wine expert. You just need to know how to express it. And it's that part of helping people to know how to express it, what to look for and how to manage the differences. We're all experts on what kind of pancakes we like and what kind of sodas we like and what kind of French food we like. We're, we're really experts on wine. You just what need that. We like. Yeah, preparation. So we picked a wine today for you to describe that we never ever picked yet on the show hmm. in over 250 visits. This is that famous Viognier from the Terroir d'Altitude of Fort de France from the south of France. Not easy to explain. So how would you translate that to get everybody wanting to taste it? Okay, I'm going to start with a quote from uh, Jay McInerney, the famous uh, novelist mm -hmm. and, and also a wine writer. And he once told me- And a friend of all of us. Amazing guy. And one of the, you know, if I had um, someone who's writing, I really look up to, it's Jay's. And he once said, Viognier, it's a French grape with American cleavage. And <laughs> I never forgot that because it's true. It's a French grape, and this is made in the Languedoc, uh, which is beautiful south of France. I see a saber there. That's very cool. Uh, <laughs> JCB saber. I need one of those. Um, Absolutely. I'm going to send you one, in fact. Absolutely. <laughs> um, it, it, you know, I asked, I told my wife, you know, is, is it my saber or, you know, are you just happy to see me or I'm happy? I to think see it's you. how you use it most likely. It, it really is. It's the motion. Um, <laughs> but, but, but anyway, Viognier is one of my favorite grapes because it doesn't need a lot of oak, if any oak. And when I taste this Paydoc, uh, Languedoc, Fortant, um, uh, Viognier, it's got some tropical quality to it. It's, um, I get a tiny bit of pineapple, tiny bit of pear, maybe a slight bit of oak. So it's got, it, it gives you something, it's generous. Um, and by the way, I liked it so much, I finished it. I'll show you the color. It's not just a pale straw uh, lemon water that we get from let's say certain Pinot Grigios. This has richness to it. It's medium, medium to full body. And then you taste it. It's ultra smooth. It's ultra creamy. It has a certain sensual quality to it. And I want more. <laughs> I, it's, it's, it's really great. And I know you have all sorts of wine. You have, uh, you know, very high end stuff, but I know this is very, um, gently priced. So that's why right. a Viognier at this price point is well, special stuff. In Aspen, you're presenting the Domaine de la Vougere, one of the most allocated wine we produce, Clos Vougeot. So we wanted to have a contrast from the top end 
<laughs> to something which is great for $30 that people can have a great time with. And I think it's fun to introduce from that price point all the way up. So it's not just, you know, the collectible wines. Now, exactly. you so charismatic. I want everybody to follow you online as well. And I know they will after this event if they're not already. Tell us a little bit about Bevimar, Bevinar and how you started and some of the very cool, because I receive all your wonderful emails and <laughs> I you. adore the provocative nature of it. Thank you for not unsubscribing, by the way. And to the world, by the way, when you unsubscribe, like those of us at the levers know you've unsubscribed. So, and I've had to do that. So thank you for seeing all the emails. Well, basically when, this terrible COVID started for me, it was my wife was actually, she's a native Australian and she was stuck in Australia because they're very serious about COVID and her parents are in their nineties and they needed her. So it took her a long time to get back. Uh, and so I had, I was stuck here in the wine sanctuary with great wine. Um, and, uh, uh, a need to help people get excited about it. So I very uh, uh, kind of organically started the Mark Oldman wine, uh, virtual wine tastings. And thank God they were successful from the start because I was worried, will anyone show up? And it became so successful. And I actually, um, in addition to doing classes, and again, I give people the best information, but I make it fun and interesting and I try to give them information. So for example, one fun bit that I'll talk about is even an empty glass. If you're in a restaurant and we're finally getting back to restaurants um, to some degree is smell your empty glass, not your full glass, but when it's still empty, smell it. And uh, Jean Charles, why would we do that? Why, why would you smell an empty glass? Do you, do you absolutely to make sure it was correctly washed to make sure there's no pre smells to it, whether it's uh, soap or, you know, any chemicals, because obviously it kills the absolute wine that is going to welcome it. So I love that. That is an insider thing that only someone like John Charles or me or great wine collectors would know. And you get better service in a restaurant, a wine loving wine integrity restaurant, the kind you'd find in San Francisco or New York or LA or Chicago or anywhere that really cares about their wine, smell your empty glass. And if they're watching you and these days they often do like, uh Oh, that's someone in the know that's someone probably in the industry. We're going to maybe pour them a, a taste of wines. We have open, we're going to treat them extra well. And here in New York, which is a jungle of, you know, needing good service, um, you need to figure out, you know, every way to signal, you know, to plead, please, you know, give me good service. So I'm always thinking about what's what hasn't come out yet about wine that's going to resonate with people that's going to be really, really uh, useful. So again, it's about set, you know, thinking longer about it and watching your friends and family in restaurants, what surprises them? What about our wine culture, which is quirky and hilarious and instructive? This whole wine world, you know, there needs to be more sideways movies. And I know you interviewed Rex Pickett. Exactly. Um, he was amazing, wasn't he? amazing and you brought out the best in him too so there needs to be more of this um I agree. Because it's just the beginning of a wildly quirky and fun and happy world well and you do it so well as well with your art so i'm hoping as you suggested that someone needs to write the next art book as you wrote the wine books you have an amazing incredible Klimt inspired portrait behind you. 
and you call it, I know, the felony room. So <laughs> tell us, as I'm, as I'm pouring another wine from Forton here, we're staying in the south of France. Oh, yeah. You say it so much better than I do. <laughs> tell <laughs> us about this felony room. That looks very intriguing. So, uh, well, first of all, I wanted to create a wine sanctuary, and my wife has been incredibly patient and uh, welcoming of it. Um, because I created it slightly before I met her and she could have torn it all away, but instead she knew how passionate I was about it. So there are wine uh, specific antiques everywhere. And then I don't have a great view here in Manhattan, but I wanted to create something almost hypnotic uh, that celebrated the merging of art and wine. And I know that's a subject you care a lot about. John Charles. So this is a, a lesser known clip called Sea Serpents 2. And um, what's amazing is, I'll just get up for a second, is so the, um, the circles here yes. are almost the circumference of a wine bottle. Um, so Clint loved these um, colorful circles. It's a light box. And then I had this metal grating made in Georgia. And um, the whole thing I mean, was a flight of fancy. I didn't know if it would work, but the reviews over the last eight or nine years have been really good on it. So I try to make this my place. And when COVID's totally gone, I'll have, I, I have very special elite not elite, but let's just say extremely high end JCB, you know, Bougeau level wine tastings here. And, um, you know, it'll be six people, eight people, and they'll, they'll see the wine oriented and antiques and they'll actually go to the felony room. I called it the felony room because, um, about, 12 years ago, and you can look this up in the New York Times, there's no exaggeration. This is the actual uh, a court transcript is online. But uh, I, you know, so it was um, at a friend's <laughs> bachelor party. He loved wine. It was in, uh, oh God, what well, it was a Tom Colicchio restaurant that no longer exists. It was on 10th Avenue. He had great wine. Sorry to promote Bordeaux to our Burgundy, and I like both, although I do have a preference for Burgund uh, Burgundy. I know um, that. That's why you forgive him. Oh, yeah, <laughs> exactly. But they're both great. I mean, we they, got they really that. are. And they're everything French. And your uh, understanding of beauty and, and nuance and elegance, uh, we, we can get into that. But uh, uh, Chateau Palmer, 1970, and it was a beautiful label. And we emptied the bottle about Ten of us, and I thought it was such a pretty bottle, gold and uh, uh, black, almost like the JCB bottle here. Actually, it's exactly the color scheme. Um, I brought the empty bottle with me outside, crossing Tenth Avenue to get home, and I hear a squad car, and <laughs> it is a New York City policeman, a uh, police car, squad car, and they get on their thing. By the way, this was during Bloomberg. So this was an offense. It's no longer an offense, which I guess is a good thing. Uh, but um, it was an open container situation. And the cops were like, well, what's in the bottle? And I'm like, oh, I'm just taking this home as a dead soldier, a souvenir, an empty bottle. And they were like, let's see the bottle. And I hand it to by the way, my friends who were with me, good friends that they are, scattered like dust. I mean, they were gone. Good friends. You know, this is what happens when the cops come. So they're gone. And I'm showing my bottle to the police. Police take it and they see a little bit of sediment wash, you know, at the bottom of the bottle. Bottle 1970. And would you expect that? John Charles to see of a course little... we love it yeah. it's probably the best part of it isn't it it really the is healthy part of the wine is the uh la, la cendrée you know the lees all the way at the bottom which are great well, oh my god I need to learn this la cendrée cendrée 
Oh like my. ashes. La ah. Yeah, yeah. I got it. But everything sounds better in French. I'm like <laughs> Gomez Adams in the Adams family. Like, you know, it is, um, you know, TPCT, uh, you know, like this, it's really, <laughs> if someone wants to shortcut themselves to being a wine uh, savant, learn the, the version of it in French because it, it just sounds <laughs> so nobody good. can understand you. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, so I told the police, this is just, they're like, there's still wine left in the bottle. I'm like, these are just color pigments that dissolve out of solution. This is just uh, sediment wash. And the cops are like, no, 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 there's still wine in here. We need to uh, write you up for an open container. So what? can you believe it? Again, no, I in New York Times, I, I have. It took me six months to get the courtroom transcript. So friends came back. They're like, you know, this guy writes about wine. And the cops, to their credit, the NYPD, they knew that they had made a mistake because it was silly. But they were like, all right, kid, this is what you do. They One of them put his arm around me. It's a mandatory criminal court appearance. But you just go down there, you plead guilty. It's not going to go on your record, blah, blah, blah. Somewhere at night, I said, you know what? I'm not going to plead guilty. I'm going to, for all the people who want to have uh, empty bottles on their shelves, I'm going to fight this. And I fought it. Uh, it took four months for it to wend its way through the New York criminal court system. You show up at the criminal court. This was awesome. It's people who've uh, reckless drivers, uh, reckless urinators. I'm sorry to say that, but like these are the people in this court. And then one person caught with an open container, the judge, an older man with white hair, uh, Eddie Albert type. They call your number, number 1622556. I go up there at the lectern. They assign a lawyer to me on the spot. I tried to bring my 1970 Chateau Palmer in with me, but there's a metal detector. It's not metal, but somehow they caught it. They're like, you need to check that. There's actually a check room at the court. They put a sticker on it. So he's like, uh, what do you do? And I go, well, sir, um, I uh, write about why. And he's like, you what? Older, older judge. And the uh, attorney assigned to me, your honor, he writes about why. And then the judge was like, okay, let me get this. You go around all day, you write about wine, you drink it. Is that true? And I, I'm kind of, uh, I feel trepidation. I go, yeah. He goes, I'm about to retire. Where do I get a job like that? And we were <laughs> off. We were off it became a de facto wine tasting in this giant courtroom, all the hang dogs, sad people, public urinators, reckless drivers, they're all listening to this. He wanted to know how much wine I had drunk in a day, the most amount, what makes wine ageable. He, he literally used this as an opportunity to learn about wine. He was very cool, I must say. And then he finally goes, you know what? Case dismissed, boom. And that was it. We so now it's it's fine for reckless uh, you know drinkers with their open container, but I will say it's no longer a mandatory criminal court appearance in New York. So. Well, that's a brilliant story, and you could see the instinctive lawyer in you knew what to do. And that's well, you're so smart, and that's exactly the only time I use my lawyering skills. But I created a room here in the wine sanctuary called the felony room. It wasn't a felony. It was more of an infraction, infraction, misdemeanor, felony. But I called it the felony room because I later, four months later, found the transcript that went exactly as I said, and I trophyized it. I actually, and I have it in a trophy case. So when you go into the felony room, seeing all sorts of great empty bottles I've had and a picture of Mick Jagger, you know, a lot of Rolling Stones mentions here, maybe a Keith Richards picture in his leopard. But there's also this trophyized um, transcript 
of my mandatory criminal court appearance. So to kind of be a little bit um, hy hyperbolic, uh, hyperbole, it was like, okay, it, it was a, my one felony. And it looks like a little gentleman's club, like a little English men's club with um, a tufted sofas. It, it actually looks a lot like your beautiful JCB. Um, you know, there, there was a, a place in New York called Casa La Femme that had these amazing hotel cost in Paris too. It's yep. just this French, yours is more French, mine's more English, but I really appreciate that European cozy drinking environment. Well, I hope we can have a fine bottle of Malbec yes. when I come to see you in New York and we could be in the felony room and maybe do a little event together. I would be honored. I would be uh, amazed and we would we would have such fun. This Malbec, by the way, um, I love the label. Um, I was again Thank in you. New Jersey clearing out my dad's house and there are deer and stags everywhere. Amazing to watch. It's like Bambi unless you're driving and there's like <laughs> a big hunk of flesh jumping into the road. <laughs> yeah, you have to be really careful. But this Malbec, I mean, this... Which I don't drink a lot of, so I'd love your description on it because those are wines that are made in the altitude of the south of France on the Mediterranean Basin. And they're quite unique. And, and we make this one in a very small lot. Laurent Sauvage is a fabulous winemaker, but I'd love your comment on it as you know more about Malbec than I do. Uh, well, I I am a, a huge Malbec fan. I've had Malbec, of course, and it's na not native. It's native France, but I've had it in its like wildly successful Argentine or Argentinian region. I've even had it in Brazil. And I'll say that even though its origins are French, this is kind of a hybrid because it's um, from such a south southerly region, uh, the Languedoc. And I think because of the top winemaking talent around it, this would be the ultimate barbecue wine. I mean, Ooh. it is full bodied, but it's not unctuous. It still has that lively acidity you'd expect from the old world. And it's got plum, black fruit, cocoa, um, a slight bit of um, coffee to it. It's a sensualist red wine. And listen, you're talking to a Burgundian lover. I, nothing gets me more excited than a great Pinot Noir from the Burgundy region of France. However, I grew up in America. I grew up loving Napa Valley. Uh, and this is my ultimate uh, uh, barbecue wine. And it's not so tannic that it couldn't go with spice. So if you've mm. got a glaze on your barbecue or if you, you know, like on ribs or if you've got some hot sauce on it, it's amazing how, uh, truth be told, I had two bottles of this and I had one last night and my wife made a dish with chicken and she was like, watch out. I put too much spice on it. And I had this last night. I'm like the slight sweetness of mm. the oak. And it's not really sweet. It's just the perception of sweetness cools down the spiciness. So if you're going to have a barbecue wine, we're, we're still, you know, we've got some summer left or some early fall. Um, I would choose this amazing Malbec. Well, thank you. What a description, Mark. God, you want me to go to barbecue now. I love it. <laughs> I know. I need some barbecue. I, I dream about luscious barbecue. And, and that's, you know, I when I was in Champagne uh, a year ago, there was a barbecue restaurant. I love how the French, you know, I go to France for the unique French. Uh, by the way, Bouff Bourguignon with this, yeah. I'll take it. A yeah. beautiful stew, uh, meat stew. However, I love how the French sometimes embrace certain American things like barbecue, too. Totally agree. Mark, two more questions. Yeah. What inspires you? <laughs> uh, I know it, it's uh, you know, because it's way, quite amazing to see yeah, how yeah. much unbelievable creativity 
you exude and mm. I have a feeling you, you've done 10% of what you have in your head. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I don't want to repeat myself. So, but I do think what inspires me is to inspire others. Yeah. I forgot what great uh, musician said, you know, what's the best thing you can do for someone? The best thing in the world, you know, and it gets, gets into mentorship and all that, but it's more than that. And that is to give someone hope, to give someone new options. I mean, new options. My mom, my very cool mom is in her mid eighties. And I brought um, this beautiful uh, number 21, JCB bubbly. And we had it with very, and she's a sophisticated, she's much more sophisticated than I, but she trusts it's my parents. So I'm like, check this out, mom. Um, you can have really good bubbly, beautiful cleansing, floral, almondy bubbly with great local pizza. And she's, you know, been under the suppression of COVID more than I have. And she was like, this is the best combination. I left her a little bit in her fridge and she texted me 85 years old, total cool cat she's like well there wasn't a cork in it because i, I didn't have one of those clamshell yeah. cha champagne closures she's like will it still be good or will it hurt me like i'm like are you <laughs> hurt you, you in a good way mom i text her i'm like this is going to be incredible you have to go for it because she was by herself that night it's look it's going to be amazing it still will have verb it might not have the quite the level of bubble, but don't discount it. Wine is heartier than you think. So this level of, there's so many misconceptions about wine and so much mythology, and there's so much anxiousness that to me, what inspires me is to calm people and to get them closer to pleasure because that's where I want to be. Wow. I'm, I'm really hard on myself. Get them you know, closer to pleasure. I love them. that. The sensualist that you are. Ah, and, and, and to me, it's a left brain, right brain tug of war because the guy who gets things done is not the sensualist. But the, but the person who says life is short and you really need to experience the sensual pleasure. So it's a constant tug of war. So I think having that heterogeneous that it, it's it's not being one way, it's having that reverse polarity, uh, which is really important, you know, having different sides and embracing that, going to an art gallery and trying to appreciate a type of art you might not think you liked. You know, even a TV, giving things a second or third chance. If you truly That's right. hate, hate them from a core, good, you know that. Check off that box but don't dismiss things too quickly and give people options. Options are everything in life. I love it. So now along the same lines, your final big message to the world and everybody's going to obviously follow now Bevimar. They're going to go and get your books. They're going to follow you all around the world on your Instagram and Facebook and all that you do, but maybe, we are August 20th, a very exciting time, still summer. Yes. What message would you have to, to the world as, as the expert, the wise man, the inspiration behind entrepreneurship, creativity, mm. and doing what you have in your mind? All right. All right. I, I've got like three or four things registering, but I, I'm going to winnow out the best because I, I want it to have impact. Uh, uh, Fate loves the fearless. And that's something I need to remind myself of because in this crazy life of lots of distractions and lots of naysayers, it's easy to be fearful. And we all are. And some of that's very natural. We were trying to uh, not be eaten by the saber toothed tiger or the leopard. You are the leopard. Um, you know, we're, it's a natural situation to uh, have fear and to have uh, worry and to also worry about what other people 
think. I mean, I do it. We all do it. However, the more successful people seem to somehow, whether it's conscious or unconscious, delude themselves, delude themselves into not caring as much about what the world thinks and follow their own muse. Mm. And the older I get, the harder that is sometimes. It's easier to play it safe. So I have to remind, see, that's the thing. They think, we all think that certain people just have it all figured out. And if I could only be that person, the grass is always greener over there. No, 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 no. It's an ongoing struggle. It's an on in, internally, it's an ongoing situation where we just have to keep telling ourselves, you know, Steve Jobs at Stanford, at my beloved Stanford gave maybe the best commencement speech mm. in the world. And I watch it once a month actually uh, it's got millions and millions of views on youtube and it is like you know uh this was when he was in his period before he came back to apple and it, he was like you know uh i realized and he then got well actually then he got back to apple but he got a cancer diagnosis and he was in a very philosophical mode and again not an angel he was probably a tough guy in the workplace. I would not want to have been his employee. But in this commencement speech, Steve Jobs said, well, you know, um, when you realize, and not to get too heavy on us because this, these wines have been so light and happy and delicious, but, you know, when you realize um, life is short and we're all going to die and, you know, um, all feelings of humiliation and embarrassment fade away when you keep reminding yourself that life is short uh and you and and you have to look in the mirror and you have to ask yourself you know have i spent too many days looking in the mirror and saying this just doesn't fit me and i need to find something more in my life that excites me that brings the passion um that's a great earmark to life and i love it so everyone check out the Steve Jobs uh, commencement speech on uh, on the Stanford YouTube website. I personally, I don't have it figured out. I'm I'm looking at it at least once a month. Well, and check the Bacchus on the campus too. Because <laughs> between the two great speeches, there's Steve Jobs and Mark Oldman as well. Mark, that was a tremendous a uh, really surreal and <laughs> sensualist hour together. And, you know, we miss you on the West Coast, so you know you're welcome anytime. Oh. And we miss you in Burgundy too. So I know you're going to call Delta Airlines <laughs> and you're going to come our way. <laughs> We're going to have a few 69s together. I'm talking <laughs> wine. And yes, please. <laughs> we'll get our wives as well together. And we're going to have an amazing time. So, Mark, congratulations. I really want to thank you for all what you do, for keeping us as well so inspired at all time, and for being so entertaining, educational, and so fun in the world of wine, and, and which I love as well, full of incredible content. Because your message, as you said, it doesn't take eight pages to get the three lines of... That's it. And I love that in your books, in your speech, in your presentation. I cannot wait to see your next seminar. So thank you for being with us and cannot wait to have JCB 21 and pizza barbecue. <laughs> <laughs> and we're gonna go high on the 1969 scale with some Club Rougeau soon. So to very soon. I can't wait, John Charles, you're the best. Enchanté and Sante, and cheers. To the felony room. <laughs> to the felony room. <laughs>